Hello, and welcome to the 2024 Connorsville State of the City. I am honored to have been chosen to serve a second term and am looking forward to what the next four years will bring. When I came into office in 2020, there were three problem areas we focused on and will continue to focus on going forward. People pay, equipment facilities, and placemaking. Since the 1980s, the city has seen a population decline resulting in each department being whittled down to bare-bone staff. Now we are seeing growth which requires more manpower to help facilitate continued growth while providing increased services to our community. There were several years in a row, in most cases over 12 years, with no base pay increases for city employees, which was a large contributing factor to our low employee morale. Our focus was on pay raises first, and then finding ways to increase manpower where we are lacking. 78% of the general fund goes towards employees, leaving 22% for everything else needed for day-to-day -day operations. This coupled with 40 plus years of population decline and the current climate of increased pay everywhere puts us in a very bad position for attraction and retention. The equipment and facilities were let go for many years without any replacement cycle established with little to no maintenance completed on the facilities. The answer we had, and still have, is we must grow as a community in order to provide the protection and services citizens need and desire. This is why we focused on placemaking strategies and marketing to promote growth. Last year, Opportunity Drive, a major investment for commercial real estate development on the north end around Walmart, was finished. Since this area is in the Opportunity Zone, we applied for and were awarded a marketing grant from Okra to help attract investments. This project also provided a much needed walking path from 37th Street to the Walmart shopping area. The walking path is a safer connection to this area, so people don't have to walk along the busy highway anymore. Autumn Trace Senior Community selected to build their beautiful assisted living facility in this area. This provides much needed housing opportunities for members of our community. The housing study we completed in 2021 was used to help attract this development by showing them the need for assisted living here in Connersville. We also completed a hotel feasibility study that shows we have a need for another hotel. But the high cost of building right now shows a return on investment lower than investors want to see. A second investment in Opportunity Drive was fast-paced health offering urgent care, behavioral health, and telehealth options. Clinics like this are important for community growth, and we are excited they chose Connersville as a location to serve. During the community planning phase of the comprehensive plan, we met with the high school students twice. This was done to see what the next generation wants to see the community look like, so when they graduate, we provide a community where they want to stay or return after college to make this their home. One of the questions asked after the first planning meeting was, what do you want to see here that you don't think will ever happen? The overwhelming response was Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks. When I went back several months later for the second planning session, I told them Dunkin' Donuts was starting construction on 30th Street. Their excitement over something they never thought we would get helped them believe our community can have the desired amenities to make this their home. Their excitement is one that drives me every day to make what seems impossible, possible. Reed Health held a groundbreaking for the new $100 million medical facility at the location of the old Kmart property. Not having a hospital is a deterrent to the growth of our community. This major investment is a piece of the puzzle to help attract and retain businesses and residents alike. It is also an opportunity for our community members who want to work in the healthcare industry to live and work right here. Equipment is starting to be delivered on site and the dirt work will begin shortly after. Nova Chemicals Corporation and Novalex Holdings collaborated to develop their first mechanical recycling facility. The facility will process post-consumer plastic films to produce the company's Syndigo Recycled Polyethylene, or RPE, at commercial scale as early as 2025, delivering over 100 million pounds of RPE to the market by 2026. The facility will employ approximately 125 people, 
and was strategically selected because of its access to abundant feedstock supply of post-consumer films from nearby metropolitan areas and easy-to-access rail service for distributing to Nova Chemicals customers. The Equipment Facilities Challenge has been significantly improved, but it's still a large need. Not one department had a replacement plan in place, so we inventoried the equipment to see the estimated cost and started developing strategies for replacement. Police and EMS have a replacement fund established, but we're still on a 20-year replacement cycle while mostly purchasing used vehicles. The specialized tools of the trade needed for officers to do their job were worn out and, in some cases, not replaced at all, so officers had to share what was available. Fire trucks are approaching 30 years old, and some safety apparatus is pushing the end of its life use. Fire stations are well maintained, but are old with problems of their own. The street department was using equipment so old, parts could not even be obtained. They were also in need of tools and equipment they did not even have for road repairs. We were able to utilize the ARPA money as matching grant funds where we could, which helped us attain more equipment with what money we received. We still have a long way to go, but have significantly reduced the replacement cycle timeline. City Hall received a grant from the Urban Enterprise Association to paint the building, giving it a fresh, new look, creating a more attractive building. This was also done to encourage other businesses to take advantage of this program and clean up the outside of their buildings. I attend the Ball State University Mayor's Institute every time it is available. This is an opportunity to network with other mayors from around the state and to receive high-level community building training from the Ball State University Indiana Communities Institute. This economic training is based on data collected by Dr. Michael Hicks that shows what the driving forces are for population growth and business growth, and it's not jobs. That data shows the population growth is occurring in communities with higher quality of life indicators. In contrast, population growth is flat in communities with higher quality of business environment indicators. People rel relocate for amenities, not for jobs, and residents with strong place attachment are less likely to leave their communities. There are three things that connect people with place, social offerings, openness, and aesthetics. Placemaking is the last piece of the puzzle that we are making major investments in. Placemaking is not new. It was used in the mid-90s and it was a design concept focusing on people and places, not cars or shopping centers. Placemaking is also a major piece of attraction for businesses. Businesses looking to locate in communities look at placemaking so their employees have a desirable community to live in. This is one factor when we applied for the HELP grant from OCRA. We committed $1 million of our ARPA money for a $1 million match from OCRA. The projects identified through the process was Offutz Park Fitness Park, an escape park pump track, playground, and a bathroom remodel in Roberts Park across from the Roberts Building. The Second Street Park and Market Street Plaza are also placemaking projects that focus on people. All three, people, pay, equipment facilities, and placemaking are equally important and work hand in hand to create a community where people want to live. If we are only making investments in one or two of these areas and not the third, community growth becomes more challenging if not negative. Each area requires an initial investment, but also a plan for sustainability going forward. The challenge is that we need a significant amount of investment in all three areas without adequate funds to do so. We constantly look at different options like grants and building partnerships with organizations to help invest in all three areas. Our strategy of revitalizing the downtown to bring people first, then business will come, is working. Celebration of the Ville, historic downtown Winterfest, and Farm to Table are the anchor events bringing people downtown. When completed, Market Street Plaza will bring multiple events downtown, increasing the people traffic. Last year, Celebration of the Ville had over 7,000 visitors attend. This event continues to gain more attraction from the surrounding areas and has grown every year. For the Community Day of Service, over 700 plants were planted, creating a softer texture to the concrete and asphalt. This spring, more plants and mulch will be added to all the mulch strips. String lights were added, creating a visually pleasing atmosphere for outdoor lifestyle events. 
Farm to Table was created to highlight local produce cooked right in front of you so members of the community can experience a nice meal while spending time with others from the community. It is not a fundraiser, but rather a time to relax and enjoy each other's company. We started it small to see how it would go and to make sure we got it right. It doubled in size a second time and we have had numerous comments about looking forward to this year's event. Historic Downtown Connorsville's Winterfest is rapidly growing as well. During the whole month of December, Downtown Connorsville saw over 51,000 visits to the downtown. Comments we hear from attendees is they feel like they are in a Hallmark movie. The long-term goal with Winterfest is to extend the opportunities to other businesses outside of downtown. This is one of the reasons we started the Christmas in the Light display at Roberts Park. Each year we want to see this grow to attract more people to visit Connorsville, eat in our restaurants, and shop in our stores. The longer they stay here, the more they spend here, giving our businesses more opportunity to succeed. The philosophy behind any city-sponsored event is that if it is successful, sponsors will come to us for sponsorship instead of us constantly asking them. This is happening and the buildings are starting to be revitalized. There is much more to be done downtown, but the number of conversations we have with businesses that want to locate downtown is growing. Last fall, we invested in a way to accurately track the number of visitors and where they come from so we can market our events more strategically. The first Tri-State Food Truck Challenge was held last September, bringing over 13,000 visitors to our airport. This event showcased our beautiful airport while showcasing our local bands to the surrounding area. Bringing people to our community is one piece. Exposing our local talent to a broad spectrum of people from all over the region only helps that local talent grow. One major problem the fire, police, and EMS faced was radio communications with each other. Each department had different radio systems and could not directly communicate with each other. The police and fire had old radios that were starting to fail, so we needed a solution. The cost to update them was $650,000, so we utilized ARPA money to get this up to date on our communications. It has taken over 12 months for everything to come in, but we are now operational and can communicate directly between departments. Police departments everywhere are all facing the same hiring and retention challenges. Hiring pools are shrinking, but the need is not. This has led to higher wages and some departments restructuring schedules. This is always a topic of discussion when I attend mayor's meetings trying to find solutions. No wage increase for many years compounds the difficulty in us being competitive in attraction and retaining officers. We are the first administration in a long time to give raises every year to at least begin making our wages more attractive. We have some officers with many years of service tell me this is the most raises they have seen in their entire career. We still have a long way to go to be more competitive, but we are making strides in this area. Vehicles and tools of the trade were also let go for far too long. The first goal of reducing the 20-year replacement cycle of vehicles was greatly reduced by utilizing ARP dollars. Our goal is to get to an eight-year cycle, which still seems like a long time for vehicles that are used for patrolling. Equipment was also a major challenge. When our SWAT team deployed, we had to call surrounding departments for gas grenades, and we didn't have masks to enter the buildings after deployment. Their helmets were old and the communications in them did not work well, increasing their risk of personal harm. Stop sticks were worn out and had to be shared between each shift so they always had at least one usable. Vehicles didn't have printers causing inefficient paperwork time. The server that is used by CDP, CDP and the Sheriff's Department was failing constantly because it was outdated and no longer serviceable. The cost was $350,000 which included two patrol vehicles and the old bookmobile for a SWAT vehicle. We utilized ARPA money, opioid fund money, insurance fund savings, and money we had saved in a vehicle fund to purchase all the equipment. Now our officers have the equipment needed to do their jobs safely, effectively, and efficiently. Ordinance enforcement saw a change with Randy Wolf being hired to replace Nick Brown. Nick started from scratch helping us build a program that hadn't existed for a long time. Randy has taken what we started and implemented new strategies to improve the process. Ordinance enforcement is vital to enhancing quality of life, 
by helping to sustain safe, healthy living conditions for residents and businesses of the city. The fire department faces the same pay and equipment challenges. Most of the trucks are approaching end of life use as well as other outdated equipment. When we looked at replacing our 30 year old ladder truck, it was around $900,000. We applied for grants, but were not selected, so we continued to look for different options. That same truck is now $1.3 million, and we were able to secure funding through the Indiana Bond Bank to purchase the truck. The reason this method was selected is that the payment for this truck does not come out of the general fund obligation. Without this option, we would not be able to replace the truck, leaving a 30 year old truck in service. Another item that was at its end of life use were the SCBAs, which are the air tanks and masks to protect the firefighters. The total cost of the SCBAs was around $280,000. We received a grant that covered 80%, leaving $80,000 to the city to cover. We used ARPA money to cover the cost. The timing of the updating of the radios and the SCBAs at the same time was we were able to match the radios with the mask so we have good quality communications when firefighters are inside a burning building. Being inside a burning building is already stressful enough. Not being able to communicate makes it even worse. These new masks have top quality communications, adding another layer of safety for our firefighters. Other equipment that got replaced was the assistant chief's truck and several small tools that need to be replaced, costing around $168,000, which we used ARP money to cover. The EMS department faces the same paid equipment challenges just like fire and police. Last year, a study showed the state of Indiana was 1,000 paramedics short without any real answers on how to address the problem. Just like the other departments, pay raises were not given for several years, once again putting us even further behind. The current ambulances we have are older and are having more maintenance issues. One ambulance was added over five years ago which was purchased used from another department. The cost of each ambulance is around $270,000 and we used ARPA money along with some saved money to purchase two new ambulances. They have been on a two plus year waiting list with expectations of being delivered sometime this year. The street department had and still has several issues with old equipment and just like the other departments have the same pay and staffing issues. Just about everything is old and broken down more than it was able to be used. To date, we have replaced a new hot box for asphalt repair, two used dump trucks, two new trash trucks, two pickup trucks, one used and one new with a snow plow and salt spreader, a UTV with a snow plow and salt spreader, lawn mowers with rear discharge to replace the side discharges that were causing insurance claims, a new backhoe, and a new loader. Road maintenance is something we have focused on so we can maximize the amount of work we are able to do with the money we have. We have around 75 miles of roads in the city with an approximate cost of $800,000 a mile to mill, pave, and update ADA ramps. We budget $375,000 and receive $375,000 in Community Crossings grant for a total of $750,000. Even though this seems like a lot of money, this puts us on an 80 year cycle. This is why we have focused on preservation methods to help make our roads last longer. Our long term goal is to touch every single road every three to five years with a maintenance program to extend the life of the road. To accomplish this, crack sealing and using different road preservation methods like micro sealing are in the long term plans. A good maintenance program takes many years to implement completely, but the result of a good program pays off in the long run. Since we can utilize the Community Crossing Grant for preservation, we are going to start dedicating a portion of the amount we receive to do road preservation work. Our trash and recycling program has been met with difficulty from day one. Our first obstacle was two trucks with cracked frames put out of service, and the automated truck we had was not maintained as it should have been, especially since it was the only one we had. We now have two new trucks that alternate so proper maintenance can be done. We wanted to offer curbside recycling after we purchased a second truck, but the tipping fees and transportation costs started escalating beyond what was feasible for us to pick up. We formed a trash committee with a council member and a board of works members to evaluate the next steps. Many ideas were tossed around, but finally we decided to bid out the trash in two ways. 
The first bid was the way we currently do it. And the alternate bid was to let someone else do it all, which is challenging because we offer more services than most trash companies do not. The Parks Department started off the year with a new director, Marla Steele. Marla faced a huge task of evaluating each area to find the strengths and weaknesses to make each one better. Like all departments, it faces the same staffing and pay problems. We have made good strides in replacing equipment and getting it on a cycle, but there is still more that needs to be done. We have updated most of the mowing equipment, tractor, UTV, and were able to use ARP money to purchase two new pickup trucks, one with a snowplow and salt box so the staff can maintain the roads and parking lots more efficiently. The facilities in the park are old and in need of more maintenance and in some cases completely updated. The playground across from Roberts Building will be replaced with our portion of the HELP grant we were awarded. This will coincide with a pump track and skate park to be built in the same area. This area will provide opportunity for all ages and all skill levels and is another piece of the puzzle for physical fitness to help with our health rankings. Another project for health and fitness is the Office Park Fitness Park, which is also part of the HELP program. We committed $1 million from our ARPA money to be matched $1 million from OCRA, all dedicated to legacy programs like the Fitness Park and Skate Park. This Fitness Park will include a walking path with exercise stations spread out along the path, a shelter, a water bottle filling station, hand sanitizing station, ADA paths to the futsal and basketball court, and update the basketball court. One goal we had was once historic downtown Connorsville Winterfest was running strong, we wanted to grow Christmas in the Park event by adding a drive through light display. This event was a huge success this year, and the park looked beautiful throughout the entire month of December. This year, we want to grow the event so it is bigger and better. If you would like to participate in this year's light display, reach out to the Parks Department and begin planning your display now. Our hope is that the light display grows every year, making Connorsville a destination city for Winterfest and Christmas in the Park. The Kennedy Bridge has been a very long process, but finally on its way to completion. There were several obstacles to overcome which caused the project to stall, but it is standing now as it should. Once the siding has been acclimated, we will be painting the bridge to protect it from the weather. The bridge is now set as it should so it can be enjoyed for all for many years to come. The Second Street Park project is another one that has taken longer than anticipated. The funds for the project were all donated, along with contractors contributing their labor as donation. The first contractor was not able to do the project, so we were left to find someone who wanted to complete the project as a donation as well. A local contractor, whose wish is to remain anonymous, stepped up and completed the dirt work for the project. The concrete work was also donated labor by a contractor with a personal connection to the Long family, and we have been waiting on them to finish their portion of the project. They are finishing up another job and should be starting on 2nd Street very shortly. River's Edge is a project that is going to take a lot of creativity to complete. The construction was never completed to the requirements of the grant, so until they are completed, we cannot apply for any DNR grants. The plan for this year is to complete what needs to be done so we are on good terms with the DNR and can apply for grants to finish the project. We have been frugal with the ARPA money, purchasing much needed equipment first, and the remaining amount is planned to be used to satisfy the DNR portion. We submitted River's Edge as a ready project, but the four to one match will still be difficult to reach with the price tag of the project. We had an estimate in 2021 of five million without lighting, which we believe inflation has moved that number closer to $8 million now. I know this number seems high for baseball fields, but as I speak with mayors from around the state, this is not out of line with what they are seeing. Market Street Plaza was commissioned by the Redevelopment Commission to be constructed on the old Burkhardt slot. The RDC committed $650,000 to the project, along with a Fayette Community Foundation securing a grant from Lilly of $80,000 and the ready grant of $200,000. We utilize the BOT, by operate transfer model, for construction so local contractors can work on it. Most government projects that are completed the traditional way are forced to use large companies that can meet the bonding requirements that small local contractors cannot. If we are using tax dollars to create quality place to benefit the community, I believe local contractors should be able to benefit from some of the work keeping the money local instead of sending it outside the community. 
we had to do a lot of redesign work and creative solutions like the street department helping remove the dirt, bringing fill we saved from the wastewater overflow project, and compact it so it is ready for foundations and the concrete pad. The permits are turned in for approval with anticipated excavation beginning in April. The prefab work is on a three to six month time frame and the contractor building the structure is available later this year. There may be periods of time that the project seems stalled while waiting for different contractors to start work. The utilities started construction on the $24 million headworks facility at the wastewater treatment plant for stormwater retention. Instead of digging up the streets and installing a stormwater collection system, the wastewater treatment plant will retain stormwater in a pond and treat it before discharging it into the river. The reasoning for this route is the cost of digging up the streets and installing a separate storm system is much more than building the wet water facility at the plant. Secondly, our plant is old and needed updated screens and pumps, so the updating was included in the new wet weather facility. This facility is also a better option when discharging water to the river since it will be processed through the facility instead of being collected off the streets and discharged directly into the river. This project completes a $30 million agreed order placed in our community by IDEM over 25 years ago. Our local government spent many years kicking the can down the road on many items in each department. My administration has been focused on fixing the problems while creating placemaking opportunities so our community can grow. There's still much work to do and we are committed to working on solutions to help propel our community forward and encourage others who want to live and work here. The future is bright and I look forward to serving another four years as the mayor of Connersville.